Coming up on Primetime News. Controversy continues over a set of election rules as a parliamentary committee deliberates on the number of constituencies for next year's general elections. South Korea says there are no signs of an imminent North Korean rocket launch ahead of the regime's key anniversary next week. Still, speculations linger over future threats as Pyongyang claims its legitimacy of developing space-related technology. And Korea's consumer prices grow in the 0% range for the 10th straight month in September. But expectations grow for a pickup in prices later this year based on improved spending. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello and welcome to Primetime News on this Friday, October 2nd. I'm Hwang Ji-hye. And I'm Daniel Che. Thank you for joining us. The National Election Commission is having a hard time fixing the number of local election districts that will be up for grabs in next April's parliamentary elections. And our Ji myung reports on a possible shifting of the political landscape in Korea. The redistricting committee under Korea's election watchdog continues to debate over the readjustment of electoral constituencies for next year's general election. What we know is that the number of districts will be at least 244, but no more than 249. Currently, 246 constituencies and 54 non-electoral seats compose the 300-seat unicameral Korean legislature. When the NEC announces the readjusted electoral map, the National Assembly's Special Committee on Political Reform will vote on whether to adopt the proposal. The main point of contention between rival parties is whether or not to retain the status quo on non-electoral seats. The ruling Sanuri party wants to reduce the number of seats selected through proportional representation and add more rural seats. If we go with the main opposition's demands to expand proportional representation, it's inevitable that rural regions will lose seats and be underrepresented. However, the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy claimed proportional representation is a constitutional tool that allows the socially vulnerable and professionals to enter politics. We need to expand the proportional representation because it helps the vulnerable and contributes to balanced regional development. 25 lawmakers representing rural regions have demanded the NEC committee's plan to be scrapped, but the committee plans to submit a final proposal to Parliament by October 13th. Rival parties hope to finalize the redrawing of electoral districts before the current regular session ends in December. Kim young Arirang News. South Korea has refuted a Japanese media report claiming that a loaded train was headed to a launch site in North Korea, adding there are no imminent signs of provocations. Kim Yeon bin reports. Korea's unification ministry said on Friday that there have been no imminent signs of a long-range missile launch by North Korea, despite a Japanese newspaper claiming otherwise. Japan's Asahi Shimbun newspaper claimed that Seoul, Washington and Tokyo spotted the movements of a freight train headed for Tongchangli missile site in the north. According to the report, the freight train appeared to have departed from a factory, but the details of the load have not been confirmed. South Korea and the U.S. are currently on watch against a possible long-distance missile launch around October 10th, marking the 70th anniversary of the founding of North Korea's ruling Workers' Party. Unification Ministry spokesman Chung Jun hee called on Pyongyang not to conduct the provocation and emphasized that North's rocket launch will be a violation of UN Security Council resolutions, which banned the communist regime from conducting missile and nuclear tests. A Defense Ministry senior official indicated on Friday that the train's movements look to be part of normal departures that take place in the north, and that there are no signs that the train headed for the launch site. The official added that there are no imminent signs of a long-range rocket launch. Kim Hyun-bin. I need news. Still, speculation lingers the North could be gearing up for future provocations, especially in that Pyongyang has told the United Nations that developing space related technology is its sovereign right. Han Daun has the details. 
The development of space-related technology for peaceful purposes is a legitimate right of a sovereign state. Our nuclear tests are self-defense measures to cope with the hostile policy and nuclear threat posed by the United States. That was the main message North Korea sent to world leaders at the UN General Assembly on Thursday local time, making it clear that North Korea will forge ahead with its space and nuclear development. The foreign minister reiterated that Pyongyang is determined to protect its dignity by firmly responding to unjust acts against it. He also mentioned that there are more than 10 nations worldwide that send satellites into space, but the UN Security Council has illegally passed a resolution that forbids North Korea doing the same. He also said the current armistice agreement should be replaced with a peace treaty and the U.S. should play a role in the process. We strongly believe the best way to secure peace and security on the Korean Peninsula is to replace the armistice agreement with a peace treaty. This would redress the abnormal relations between North Korea and the UN. The minister's speech comes as speculation rises that North Korea will launch a rocket around October 10th to mark the 70th anniversary of the founding of its Workers' Party. However, a growing number of experts say a launch would likely happen after the 10th, as no significant activity has been spotted at the North's launch site. Experts say it'll take North Korea at least 10 days to prepare for a launch. Han Dan, Arirang News. Another Korean couple has been shot dead in the Philippines, raising the number of Koreans killed in the Southeast Asian country this year to 10. For this report, we turn to our EG1. A Korean couple was found dead on the outskirts of the Philippine capital on Friday. The murder reportedly occurred in the evening of Thursday or early Friday. The man in his 50s was fatally shot by an unidentified assailant inside the house, while his wife in her 40s was supposedly shot outside their residence while attempting to flee. The Korean embassy in the Philippines said a consular representative has been assigned to gather details about the incident. Over 90,000 Koreans are living in the Philippines, and about 1.2 million visit the country every year. And the growing number of Korean victims as of recent has raised security concerns. Lax gun control in the Philippines has been cited as a reason to the increase of murder cases. The latest deaths take the total number of Korean victims in the Southeast Asian nation to 10 this year alone, including five Koreans killed in the first half of the year and another couple shot dead near the Kalabar zone area in August. Lee ji Arirang News. SK Telecom started its week-long business ban on Thursday after giving illegal levels of discounts on mobile phone handsets to new customers. This is the latest in a series of similar bans on mobile network carriers over the last few years. But how effective are they? Our Kwon jang -ho takes a closer look. In January, SK Telecom, Korea's biggest mobile network operator, gave 2,050 new customers an average of 228,000 won, or roughly 190 US dollars in cashback, on new mobile handsets. This resulted in the Korea Communications Commission imposing a fine of nearly 20 million US dollars and a seven-day business ban, which started on Thursday. The ban restricts SK Telecom from signing up new customers. Bans and fines for illegal phone subsidies have been a common occurrence in Korea over the last few years. The biggest came in March 2014, when all three of the country's major mobile phone operators, SK Telecom, KT Mobile and LG U Plus, were given 45-day business bans and a collective total of $11 million in fines. The saturation of the phone market has been cited as the reason for the continued illegal promotions. There were 57 million phone contracts signed last year, which is more than the total population of Korea at just over 50 million. With market growth minimal, mobile phone carriers are less scrapping to win over each other's customers. A new law called the Mobile Distribution Act went into effect last year to curb the excessive discounts. Although it cooled competition among the companies and the number of people switching between telecoms decreased, Sanctions such as the latest ban on SK are said to lack enough impact to stop illegal subsidies. 
SK Telecom is estimated to lose around 30,000 new customers over the next week. When you have 25 million customers already, 30,000 is not that significant. If it had been before the new Telecoms Act, the loss would have been far greater. Korea has posted a current account surplus every month for three and a half years now. The Bank of Korea said Friday that the surplus came to roughly eight and a half billion U.S. dollars in August. That's eight hundred million dollars less than the surplus recorded a month ago. In August, both exports and imports continued to drop from the previous year. Exports dropped nearly 12 percent on year, while imports plunged a 17.7 percent. Korea's consumer price growth remained stuck in the 0% range for the 10th straight month in September. But with the government pouring efforts and boosting spending, some expect prices to grow faster towards the end of this year. Kwon Zwa reports. At 110.04, Korea's consumer price index rose by 0.6% in September from the same month a year ago. According to Statistics Korea Friday, it's the 10th straight month the country has posted growth in the 0 percent range since December's 0 point8 percent rise, keeping concerns alive that the nation is on a deflationary track. Low global oil prices are seen as the main culprit of sluggish growth in domestic prices. Oil product prices plummeted almost 19 percent on year, influencing gas, electricity and water prices, which fell by almost 10 percent. But the hit was bigger on the first half of this year, with global oil prices beginning to plunge significantly in the end of 2014. We're seeing an improvement in consumer prices in the second half of this year as a base effect is appearing. Although experts say inflation won't reach the central bank's target of at least 2.5 percent in the near future, government measures have been raising consumer sentiment. Reductions on consumption taxes and Korea's version of Black Friday are expected to boost consumer spending and raise prices moving towards the end of the year. Another positive factor is that core inflation, prices that exclude the oil and food sectors, remained at a healthier 2 percent level growth throughout the year. The Ministry of Strategy and Finance said Friday the government will closely monitor global oil prices and weather conditions for the remainder of the year and focus on managing prices closely related to daily spending such as food, energy, medical services, education and housing. Kwon Suha, Arirang News. South Korea's army is hosting a festival to display its military prowess and even provide a chance for the public to handle the actual weapons used and take part in military training exercises as well. Our Connie Kim didn't miss out on this opportunity to gear up for action. Take a look. Seven helicopters decorate the skies to celebrate the opening of Korea's largest army festival in the central city of Kaeryong. Under the theme communicating with people and receiving trust, the 13th Ground Forces Festival provided visitors a glimpse into the Army. From multiple rocket launchers and battle tanks to attack helicopters, about 150 pieces of the latest weaponry were on display. The event was an eye-opening experience for women and children as it's likely their first time seeing weapons, but was also meaningful to those who served in the military. I don't remember seeing some of the tanks here when I was in the military. It was also interesting to see various artillery on display. What makes the event more interesting is that people get an authentic, hands-on military experience, which would include the chance to ride in a tank. It was scary at first because of the loud noise the tank made, but I got used to it. It was exciting to ride a tank that I've only seen on television. There are more than 45 activities for visitors, and one of the most popular is a gun range where people can test their shooting skills. If you think you're brave enough, the festival encourages people to participate in special ops exercises, such as jumping off from this 11 meter high mock tower used for parachute training. <laughs> Oh, no. 
Other military performances, such as this Korea-U.S. joint drill, are scheduled throughout the day to keep people entertained. The festival, offering exciting and thrilling experiences, is free to the public and runs until October 6th. Connie Kim, Arirang News, Kaeryong. Koreans as well as tourists in the nation got a chance to not just soak in the arts but to let their imagination take flight by creating their own artworks right here in the middle of bustling Seoul. Our Woo Soo-young takes us there. Locals and foreigners in Seoul apply paint to a five-meter-long canvas. The brush strokes are a prelude to a five-day street fair run by the Korean Fine Arts Association. Today's event is about getting the people together Drawing Korean art, uh, for me, was first time. It looks uh, very simple, but it's very difficult. In the end, it comes all together as one simple, beautiful piece. Many activities are available for visitors at the 20 stalls in Gwangamun Citizens Park, such as printing with wood blocks, designing mugs, and various forms of traditional Korean art. Yeah, it's very different for me because I don't have something like this in my country. And I enjoy a lot. It's very beautiful. More than 2,000 artists are also showcasing and selling their works, livening up the venue with colorful pieces. My canvas represents a mother's embrace, holding the seed which symbolizes the strength and preciousness of human life. I'm happy to present my work at this big festival. I hope many people come by and approach art lightheartedly. Sponsored by the Ministry of Culture, this fair is part of an initiative to communicate art in open spaces in ways that the general public can enjoy. To nurture cultural prosperity, the government will do its best to expand these programs and bring art to the daily lives of the public. For the next few days, all passers-by are invited to participate and channel their creativity with various forms of art. Young. Arirang News. And now for headlines from around the world, we turn to our Bruce Harrison at the News Center. Today's focus, another school shooting rocks the U.S. Russia reveals its bombing campaign in Syria will continue for months and two tennis champions pay respects at the site of a fatal bombing in Bangkok. Well, Bruce, first let's start with a deadly, a deadly shooting in, on Thursday. Uh, uh, President Barack Obama responded with anger more than anything this time. Yes, that's, that's true, Daniel. Uh, this small town and small college uh, will also now forever be associated with tragic acts of gun violence that have become somewhat of an identifying mark of contemporary American culture. Following the shooting, President Barack Obama did speak angrily about the need for greater gun control. Many argue that other factors such as mental illness and religious extremism are behind the bloodshed. As of now, and setting blame aside, grieving in Roseburg, Oregon is just beginning. The town held a candlelight vigil, and today the names of the nine people killed are expected to be released. Our Yusuan tells us what happened in that community. On Thursday, in the usually peaceful city of Roseburg, Oregon, chaos ensued when a gunman opened fire at Umpqua Community College, killing at least nine and injuring seven others. Everything, we just dropped everything and we ran. And when we ran out of the building, everybody went every which way. It was so chaotic. The number of deaths is lower than earlier reports, but the community has been left in shock and despair as they mourn for the victims Thursday evening. American media reported that the suspected shooter was a 26 year old man by the name of Chris Harper Mercer, but officials have not confirmed the report. The police said the shooter died after an exchange of gunfire with officers and added that it's too early to comment on a motive or whether he acted alone. The Oregon massacre is one of the many mass shootings that have taken place this year in the U.S., and it has once again fueled the debate on tighter gun control laws. U.S. President Barack Obama, at a briefing just hours after the incident, said thoughts and prayers were not enough to prevent the killings. The United States of America is the one advanced nation on earth in which we do not have sufficient common sense gun safety laws, even in the face of repeated mass killings. CNN reported that four firearms were found on the scene.
Survivors of the rampage have been transported away from campus, while the injured, including three in critical condition, are being treated at a nearby hospital. Lee Soo-in, Arirang News. Russian lawmaker, a Russian lawmaker rather, says airstrikes in Syria could last up to four months. Alexei Pushkov also told a French radio station the strikes are going to intensify. Leading Russian academics and political analysts offered their own timetable, saying the air campaign will continue until Syrian government forces retake oil fields in northern Syria from the Islamic State. The Russian Air Force will continue its operations until the Syrian army, which is cooperating with the Iraqi army and militias, take control of the northern part of the country. The experts challenged Western criticisms that the airstrikes are aimed at the opposition of the Syrian government. Russian President Vladimir Putin will soon meet leaders of France, Germany and Ukraine in Paris for talks about Ukraine, though the topic will likely shift to the Syrian crisis. Two of the world's best tennis players will play a sold-out exhibition match in Thailand. World number one Novak Djokovic and 14-time Grand Slam champion Rafael Nadal will compete in Bangkok in a match aimed at improving confidence in the country's safety. Tourism has suffered in Thailand following a fatal bomb attack in August at a popular shrine downtown. Djokovic and Nadal visited the Erawan shrine and placed flower garlands at the site where 20 people were killed, including 14 foreigners. The tennis heavyweights also met Thailand's prime minister. They presented the junta leader with tennis rackets, who in turn gave them golden replicas of traditional Thai masks. The exhibition is billed back to Thailand, and for serving as somewhat foreign political ambassadors for Thai tourism, the pair will earn around 4.1 million U.S. dollars to do what they do best. And that's a glimpse of the world today. Have a great weekend. Hello, I'm Yi Ji-hyun with your latest weather updates. What a cold morning we had today, and not surprisingly, we kicked off on their single digits here in Seoul at 8.6 degrees Celsius, the lowest temperature of the season to date. But tomorrow, we'll wake up to warmer morning, and the afternoon readings should also be a couple of degrees higher than today. And conditions will be mostly sunny through the weekend, with highs remaining in the low 20s for the capital area and in the mid 20s in the southern region. So, if you're planning on checking out some autumn festivals or go hiking, the weather will definitely be favorable for it. And taking a close a look at the readings for tomorrow. Daily high here in Seoul will climb up to 23, Daegu will rise to 27, while Gwangju and Busan getting up to 25. And as for the other regions, it seems like Daejeon and Jeju Island will see a high of 25 and 24, while Dokdo peaks at 22. Now the weather outlook for the next week looks promising, with daily lows remaining in the low teens and highs staying in the seasonal average temperatures under mostly sunny skies. Well, that's Korea for you, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe. And that wraps up this week's edition of Primetime News. Thank you for staying with us. We will be back same time next week. Have a great weekend and goodbye for now.